So I'm going to start, start, and I'm going to talk about quality of care and quality of life in residential care. I'll start by defining so that we're all on the same page what residential care is. These are settings that provide facility-based care where people live permanently with 24-7 housekeeping, personal, and health care services. Importantly, this is a setting that provides a combination of social and health services. The funding models are varied for it, and they're becoming increasingly varied. And it, it also is not covered by the Canada Health Act. That has important implications as children disperse across the country and wish to bring their parents to live with them in the end stages. Um, it, that isn't always feasible or possible. There are about 1,800 long-term care facilities in Canada, distributed as you see there on the slide. And about 200,000 of the people who live in residential care at any one time are over 65. That's not a static figure. The throughput in the system is very high. Uh, lengths of stays are shortening all the time. These are just two slides to show you that Canada is a middle of the pack performer in terms of long-term care users as a share of the population. And the percentage of GDP that goes to long-term care expenditure, and you can see with the orange triangles, the projections about where we're going to be in 2050. The typical resident is a female. She's over 80. If she's in a publicly funded system, she has a lower income. She's single, she has dementia, and at least two or three other chronic diseases. She's medically and socially complex, frail, and highly vulnerable. A very small proportion, but an important proportion that's not well understood are what's called the unbefriended elderly. These are people with no family or friend support, where the so-called state is the legal guardian. These are essentially orphans in the system. The profile of the re resident, however, is changing quite rapidly in long-term care. They come increasingly late in the trajectory of their uh, disease. Therefore, they come with much higher dependency needs. They're more medically complex, and social engagement is even more difficult. As everyone in the room knows, dementia follows a frailty pattern of decline with severe disability often in the last year of life and often dramatic declines in the last months of life. The profile is changing, but the staffing and other key resource profiles have remained at steady state, which essentially means a net loss in resource in this sector. So how do we frame the challenge in residential care? We have a global opportunity to consider the adequacy and the quality of social and health care provision to support people for whom self-care is a diminishing or unobtainable option. However, as a consequence of history, chronic underinvestment and piecemeal regulatory response to substandard practice, working in these settings has afforded extraordinarily low status, giving rise to all sorts of quality challenges and workforce instability. And at its most fundamental, the choices we make about what we do in this sector are value choices. Who is valued, and thus to whom are resources allocated? As I go through the next three or four slides, I'd like you to think about whether if you were on an acute post-cardiac ward or in a neonatal intensive care unit, if we would find what's happening in terms of the rates of prevalence of certain conditions acceptable. We've got a 35 at least year history of reports describing the unacceptable state of quality of care and long-term care, and we haven't changed a thing. The reports essentially say the same thing today as they did 35 years ago. Now, there are important and um, glorious anecdotal examples of things where it's done better, but across the system as a whole, we haven't changed much. It suggests, then, a large international system-level problem. It's a problem that's complex, and it's at least one of the problems that could be categorized as a wicked problem. The real goal in long-term care is a good last stage of life and a good death, despite the losses in advancing age and the natural course of this disease and the other chronic diseases that accompany it. A good last stage of life is an enormous, but it is an achievable challenge, but it requires intention, will, and resources. 
There's relatively little work done about the relationship of quality of care to quality of life, but we know that it's not a straight up one-to-one -one relationship. Most of us would consider quality of care to be a necessary but insufficient condition for quality of life. That is, we would argue that sitting with a three inch bone deep pressure ulcer makes it very difficult to have good quality of life. Quality of life encompasses a whole raft of things, some of which are listed on this slide. Some of the areas where we can have the biggest impact in residential care include the sensory pleasures, touch, taste, sound, smell, freedom from pain, but there are a host of other things that we can do around giving people a sense of belonging, helping them to maintain identity, etc. Symptom control has been a major approach to monitoring quality of care. These are just some examples of relatively recent studies that look at symptom control in later stages of life. Um, most of the work in this area has been done in the United States, followed by Europe. There's very little work done in Canada. So it's not uncommon to look at studies that will tell you that 50% of people have severe pain in the last period of life, whether it's the last week or the last 30 days or the last year. There's new work out of Belgium which suggests that only about half of people die peacefully in long-term care. The work um, by Hendricks is particularly important because pain and agitation together create a particularly difficult pattern of suffering. The Italians have done work, as have others, on potentially inappropriate practices. I'm sure Dr. Stagidar will have comments about what it means when you have a long-term care setting where 43% of the people get emergency interventions in the last 30 days of life. So we have a problem. Susan Mitchell in the United States has done the landmark work on people, the clinical course of people with severe dementia. Going from left to right, from a light to a dark bar, you see what happens as people approach death. So even 12 months out, we have unacceptably high rates of some symptoms. But as you approach death, the burden becomes higher and higher. Pain and dyspnea in particular are uncomfortable, frightening symptoms. Pressure ulcers um, are not only um, uncomfortable and cause pain, and suffering, they're extremely expensive to the system. Agitation uh, is upsetting not just to the resident, but to the family. There, isn't, there wasn't any Canadian data until we just uh, published a piece. Um, the two symptoms that we have that are the closest to Mitchell's show a similar pattern. As people approach death, and so for the last 12 months of their life, we see an increasing level of dyspnea and pain and for us, we think importantly, we've been able to demonstrate, however, that if you're in a nursing home that has a more favorable environment, this, the green dots on this slide, your symptom burden, while still unacceptably high, is lower, so that offers us some potential for new areas of intervention. So what are the implications? At minimum, we need a values-based discussion about what we are willing to do to support older adults with dementia in the last stage of life. We need meaningful engagement of people with dementia and their caregivers. We need workforce stability discussions, meaningful discussions. We need resource reallocations discussions, hence the need for values-based discussions. There's enough money in the system to address this problem. It's how we allocate those resources. And one of the easier things to tackle is we need a Canada-wide data system that enables us to systematically measure quality in every nursing home in every province. Currently, we have a data system, but only in some of the provinces. So that's the end of my short presentation. This is just a reminder that at least in the United States, um, they're projecting that among people who turn 65, that four in 10 will need long-term care for two or more years. So it's going to be difficult for large proportions of the population to escape this particular part of the system. Thank you.